Thank you for joining us here online at Hope Church, Boulder City, Nevada. We are honored that you are here, and we believe that God is going to use this service to bless you and many others around the world. Here at Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live a life of a Jesus follower. We believe that a Jesus follower abides in Christ, connects in community, and shares in the mission. There are so many amazing things happening in our church that we'd like for you to be a part of. If you'd like to find out more, please visit us at hopechurchbc.com or you can find us on Facebook at HC Boulder City. On behalf of Hope, we thank you once again for worshiping with us and we pray that you enjoy the service. Boulder City. How are you? It is good to be home. I missed y'all. Nell and I both did. Well, if you're a guest with us today, you honor us with your presence. Let me encourage you to do a couple things. One is to make sure that you get yourself a gift bag from the table in the foyer. Uh, there are a couple nice items in there. There's a DVD in there called God of Wonders. That's a really strong a defense of the creation of God as depicted in Genesis from a scientific perspective. Uh, that's just kind of a, a bit of a science buff thing that I like, but also in there uh, will be a coffee mug. Let me encourage you, if you are a couple, that you get two of those so you can each have one. But also in there and in the seat pocket in front of you should be a, a connection card. And we would ask you to give us some basic information if you would like to be on the list because every week, most every week, been gone for a few weeks, most every week we produce a, a video update that lets you know what's going on here at Hope Church Boulder City. And if you would like to get that and know what we are about and know what we are doing, uh, make sure you give us at least either uh, a phone number so we can put you on the list to text you a link for the video that you can watch on your phone. Or if you give it to, if you give us your email, we will send it to you as a link in an email for you to watch the video. They're just YouTube videos; you can access them easily. But uh, like I said, it is good to be back. You may be noticing that I am not wearing the headset. I'm holding this. That's because I'm not preaching today. I get to come home and get preached to by Ricky Harris. Harris, Rick, <laughs> Rick, Ricky is from the. The, the, the main campus, and I don't even know what your role is there. <laughs> Congregational care. So Ricky's going to come, and he's going to be bringing to us today a message from the 23rd Psalm. And I'm, I'm convinced that it's going to be awesome and that you're all gonna, we are all going to benefit from it. Well, we are here, just like mo every other week, for at least these two reasons. One, to worship God in spirit and in truth. The team can lead us, but the worship part is up to you but they will give us the opportunity to do so because we know God is worthy of our worship. God is worthy of our praise for what he's done in our life. And again, our worship because of simply who he is. But the next thing we want to do is that we want to, we want to hear from God. We want the Holy Spirit of God to take the word of God and show us things that we would not be able to understand otherwise. Deep spiritual things that will help us be more like Christ. And so... With those two things in mind, we're going to go ahead and start on the first one. That is worshiping God in spirit and in truth. Michael, good to see you. Team, uh, I've, we've missed y'all, and we're looking forward to it. God bless you. Amen. Well, good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. Good morning, Hope Church, Boulder City. Amen. God is good. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's stand to our feet as we worship our Lord and Savior. Surrounds me. 
come on, there's nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear, for I am safe with you. Come on, so when I fight, so when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my head lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll see through the night, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who can be against me? For Jesus, there's no service, we take a few minutes and we ask God to push our reset buttons. You know, it'd be a, an absolute tragedy for us to come into God's house, uh, Him desiring to meet with us, and for us to have something in our lives and our hearts that would prevent us from doing so. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I, I didn't come here just to have church. Uh, I, I come here to meet with God. I come here to be, to hear I come here so that God can hear from me, and I can hear from God, and that we, that, that we as His people can be changed by it. Amen? And that's an awesome opportunity, and I'd hate for us to blow it. So what we do is, again, we ask God to push the reset button. So let's pray. Amen. God, we are here because you desire to meet with us even more than we desire to meet with you. Lord, you, you know we need to meet with you even more than we know we need to meet with you. And God, the last thing we want to do is to try to meet with you uh, in, in an unfit fashion. And, and Lord, by that we mean that we don't want there to be any hindrances to us hearing from you. 
So, Lord, we ask you to clear our minds, clear our hearts of all the busyness of the, of the week we've just had. Lord, our, our, our country is in, a, in chaos. Our, our lives are just mega busy. There's just so much stuff going on. It's easy to walk through the doors and just bring all that baggage in with us. And Lord, we don't want to have to sort and find our way through that to get to you. So, Lord, we ask you, in the name of Jesus, that you would... Give us the freedom from all that junk for the next hour. God, the busyness, the responsibilities, even sometimes, Lord, the bitterness because people do things they should not do and we, and we carry that with us. God, we ask you to just sweep it all away. God, that we might have clarity of thought concerns worshiping and praising and hearing from you. So Lord, we lay all that stuff at your, at your feet and ask you just to take it. But Lord, also we don't want to come into your house and approach your presence with anything less than clean hands and pure hearts. And God, the problem with that is, is that we, even though we are your children, we still sin. And while our relationship with you is undamaged, our fellowship with you is damaged and hindered by our sin. But God, you knew we were going to, to, to be in this condition, in this situation, so you gave us a promise in 1 John 1, 9, where you said that if we will confess our sins that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God, that is the only way we can be made right to enter into your presence with those clean hands and pure hearts. Lord, the passage starts out with us confessing our sin. So Lord, right now we do that because our sins are many. having confessed our sins before you then comes the, the good part the promise that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness Lord to put us in a right state for your presence oh God those hands that we had that were dirty from our sin are now clean Those hearts that harbored things on our confession and that promise are now clear. And oh God, with, with clarity of thought, clarity of focus, and clean hands and pure hearts, now, oh God, we come into your presence. And we ask you, oh Holy Spirit, to meet with us, manifest yourself in real and tangible ways. Lord as flawed as we are we still love you and we desperately desire and need fellowship with you so we ask you to grant us that privilege in Jesus name Amen
Father, you said in your word, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? So God, today we give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. For it was you who paid a debt you did not owe. And we owed a debt that we could not pay. Now we can sing this brand new song. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship freely and to come into your house. get all the glory out of everything that we do. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Summer of 1800, in fact it was in July of 1800, America saw its, its first tent meeting. This is not that meeting, this is just a tent meeting from early in America's 20th century. The first tent meeting was in the Appalachian Mountains of Kentucky. That era that began there ushered in the salvation of millions of people across America and into Europe and Great Britain. And it, pro it produced several big names in America's Christian history with that practice actually continuing to this day in fact in 1949 a tent meeting in Los Angeles that ended up lasting two months and was attended by 350,000 people is what thrust Billy Graham into the spotlight as America's pastor but long before those tent meetings were a thing, there was a truly old-fashioned tent meeting with another, there are no photos, <laughs> with another name you'll recognize, Moses. As I said last week, today we're kicking off a new sermon series entitled, Who is God? Today's message, as you can see, is called an old-fashioned tent meeting and the entire series is going to be rooted in the conversation that took place between Moses and God in that tent during that meeting you know who, who is God fortunately many of us here have a, a head start on knowing who God is and uh, hopefully the fact that I've been standing here in this spot for seven years trying to preach the word of God faithfully has contributed to that so why do we need, why do the people of God need a sermon series entitled, Who is God? Well, let me say this. While, while we may already have a good start on understanding who God is, I'm sure we'd all say that there's a lot that we don't know about him. And there's a lot more we need to know about him. But not only do we need to know more about God, but we also need, with, even with the information we now have, a more biblical view of God. And here's what I mean. I'm going to go back to something I said some time back. I honestly believe that the people of God will be facing some circumstances, even perhaps persecution, that the Christians around the world know a lot about, but we in America don't know anything about. And with that in mind, I, I almost feel I would be derelict in my duties if I did not preach, to be honest, more clearly and less apologetically. So with that in mind, let me go back to why we need, even with the information we do have and know about God, why do we need a more biblical vision of God? Well, it's because we play favorites with the knowledge that we do have about God. We conveniently ignore some truths about God and overly emphasize others, <laughs> you know, like the ones we like. We like to hang out in some spiritual places more than other spiritual places. 
We like to sing, think, and talk about God's grace, His mercy, His patience, and His love, and hallelujah for those things. Amen? But we've all read and heard about the anger of God, the jealousy of God. We know the wrath of God is just as real as the love of God, but we don't sing about it. We don't like to think about it, and we seldom talk about it. We want God to be who we want God to be. And we want that more than we want Him to be who He really is. So we tend to dwell on the characteristics of God that we like. And I admit that's natural. That didn't make it good. We sing, we talk, and we pray about what God can do for us. If we were to be honest, we'd have to admit that we are oftentimes more the central figure of our songs, prayers, and spiritual conversations than God is. Well, He's in there. He's usually there to do something for us. And by over and over emphasizing the characteristics of God that we prefer, we, in effect, try to create God in our own image because he's more palatable that way I'm afraid that we've slowly drifted to a place where we see God is more useful to us than he is beautiful to us and awesome to us But Jesus said God is looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Those two things, what that means is, one, that we are supposed to worship him on a spiritual level with the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us. That there is a connection between our spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the person of God. We're supposed to worship him on a spiritual level that's impossible for the unsaved to do because they lack the Holy Spirit. But secondly, he wants us to worship him for who he really is. Worship him. Jesus said, God is looking for those who worship him in spirit and in truth. So, I'm going to ask the question again. Why do we need a series called Who is God? To help us reboot our understanding of him. Well, the passage that we will be looking at throughout this entire series, you see there on the screen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. I will have the verses up on the screen. But before we start looking at some of those verses, I want to give you some context from the preceding passages that lead up to where we're going to be camping for at least a couple months. The people of God had escaped from the slavery of the Egyptians. They had the the Red Sea. They had already passed through the Red Sea. They had seen God move on their behalf as he opened it up for them to walk on dry ground and then to let it close on the Egyptian armies who pursued them. And we come to the point in the in the, in the narrative where, the, where God has called Moses up to Mount Sinai and is giving him the Ten Commandments. And while doing so, the people of God in the, in the valley grew impatient and thought Moses wasn't coming back. So they, so they basically kind of, I'm not going to say forced, because influenced Aaron to the point that he made them a golden calf to worship. You can't, have you ever wondered during all of that while that was going on, where were the people of God? We don't see any objection, any opposition to what the loud crowd called for. And then we see the anger of God towards his people. He said, the Lord, the Bible says, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, they are an obstinate people. (laughs) And guess what? We're no different. I don't know what we would possibly think would make us any different. Naturally. He said, now then, let me alone 
This is God speaking to Moses. Leave me to my devices that my anger may burn against them and that I might destroy them. And I will make of you a great nation. We'll do this without them. Fortunately for them, Moses talked him out of it. But then Moses goes down with the Ten Commandments, and you see his anger as he comes down, and he sees what's going on, and he throws and breaks the, the tablet with the Ten Commandments that were written, as the Bible says, with the finger of God. And then a little after that, we see Moses and God having that old-fashioned tent meeting. It says, now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. Whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of God would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent as if to tell everybody else, not now, do not disturb. And the Lord would speak with Moses. And we're going we're gonna to be looking at entering into that conversation, that narrative where, where God and Moses are speaking back and forth, as the Bible says, face to face, as friend to friend. And it's in that tent meeting that we pick up. And as I mentioned, today we're kicking off a new series titled, Who is God? And here's what this series is going to look like today and moving forward. Today we're going to do the lead up to a description of God that will answer that question, who is God? But it's not just any description of God. It's God's description of God. It's God's description of himself. In Exodus 34, God actually describes himself to Moses. But today we're going to look at what led up to that part of the conversation where God describes himself to Moses. And then for the subsequent weeks, we're going to spend the rest of the series drilling down into that conversation and that description of, that God gave of himself. So today we're going to ask and answer two questions. First of all, what did Moses ask for in this conversation? Because Moses asked for some things. Let me start by saying Moses asked the right questions. And this is important because if we really want to know God better, we might want to consider approaching God like Moses approached God. Because the approach Moses took elicited an incredible response. And I think the model that we'll see is one worthy of mimicking. Verse 12, it says, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, I mean, in other words, to the promised land, but you yourself have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moreover, you have said, I have known you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. And it's almost like, okay, well, God, if I have found favor in your sight... Could you please help me some more? Let me know who you are going. You hear you have me leading these people, so many of them. Who are you going to send with me if I have found favor in your sight? Give me some comforting instructions or, or, or comforting companion to help in this. Now, therefore, I pray you. In other words, he's saying, please. If I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you. As we'll see in a minute, this is the, the first thing Moses asked. Let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. He wanted to find yet more favor in God's sight. He said, let me know your ways, but that wasn't all. Let me know your ways that I may know you as a person so that I might find more favor in your sight. What he's saying here is, show me your ways so that I might know who you are and I will adopt my, and adapt my, your lifestyle, your ways, and I will adapt my life to those ways so I can find yet more favor in your eyes. And in response, he, God, said, my presence shall go. He said, who are you going to send with me? He said, my presence will go with you. Wow, that beats anybody else. 
My presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. Then he, meaning Moses, said to him, God, If your presence does not go, presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. That's the second thing Moses asked for. We'll look at it in a little more detail. If your presence does not go with us, Moses here is asking for the presence of God. Then in verse 16, For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not by your going with us that you and that, that we, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. Isn't this what makes us different? Your presence going with us? If I have found favor in your sight, the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing of which you have spoken. For you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. And then Moses takes it a whole nother level. He said, all right, I got you this far. <laughs> One more thing. Show me your glory. So the three things that Moses asked for. First he asked for, he said, show me your ways. In verse 13 he said, let me know your ways that I may know you so that I may find favor in your sight. When you, are, you or I want to know who someone is, we make the mistake of judging them by what they say they believe. And we've all been around the block enough times to hear politicians say one thing and do another. A person's words very often are not an accurate picture of who they are as they describe themselves. If you want to know who a person is, you don't listen to the words, you watch their actions. I can't tell you. I can't tell you in the 35, 36 years of being in the ministry how many times I have, I've had people, church people, tell me who they are with their words only to later see when there's pressure that their actions prove their words to be hollow. Much like the obstinate people in the valley who, because of the absence of Moses just ran totally off the rails but God Moses wanted to know God's ways so he could know who God is so he could conduct his life in a way that would be pleasing to God and find yet more favor in his eyes is that why we want to know God so that we can adjust to him Second thing he asked, he said, give me your presence. In verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. Moses wasn't willing to go another step toward the promised land. That's where they were headed without the presence of God. Moses would choose to stay in the desert. Moses knew that it's better to stay in the desert and have the presence of God than to be in the promised land without him. We want the promised land. With or without him. The third thing Moses asked for, he said, show me your glory. You know, you've likely heard this story, but... When was the last time we asked God to show us his glory? It seemed like Moses wanted to see the glory of God so he could more fully understand and appreciate the person of God. But the, instead of these questions, there are sometimes we ask different questions. This is not, these are not questions we commonly ask. 
we would ask things like, show me your will. Now, you may be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? Because in effect, by asking God to show us his will for our lives, is that always a bad thing? No, but the motivation is usually show us your will so I can know my ways, so I can know what I'm supposed to do because I want to get on with it. Moses wanted to know God's way so he could know God for who he is. Secondly, we, we say things like, give me your power. You know, we ask for things like the power of God to, to help break addiction, to, to heal marriages, and, and to bring about health, and to, to make me comfortable. But you notice these things. If we but were to ask for, in the first case, show me your ways, O God, we would know his will. Because we could mimic his ways and be in his will. If we were to ask for something like, give me your presence, we would have his power in our lives. If we were walking close with him, as James says, if we were to, to draw near to God, he promised to draw near to us and we would have his power. But we skip the person of God and we want the benefits of God. Thirdly, we ask things like, show me your goodness. Be good to me. Now, we celebrate all these things. But should we not be celebrating first the person and not the package of benefits that comes with him? Moses saw a, a trailing, if you know the story, and we'll get to it, but Moses saw the trailing gl glimpse of God's glory, and his life was never the same. But that was the person of God. Moses just wanted God, not a benefit package. No wonder he got more response than we commonly do. You've all known people. We've probably all been people that usually approach others more often when we need something from them than we just simply want their company. So Moses asked, show me your ways, give me your presence, and show me your glory. So, so how did God answer? We're about to see some characteristics of God that we never sing about. <laughs> And if we're going to worship God not only in spirit but also in truth, we have to worship him for these things as well because these are who he is, and that's the question we're trying to answer. Who is God? First of all, God answered by showing himself to have an untamable grace. What do I mean by that? Well, grace we know. But we tend to think that the, the grace of God is just a, just a given and it's, and it's given to everybody and it's always given to us. We think that because God's nature doesn't change, he's the same yesterday, today, and, to, and forever, that his actions don't change. And that's not true. In verse 9, 19, he said, and he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. Now, that's, say, putting it, that's stating it positively. God is saying, I'm going to be gracious and I'm going to show compassion to some people. But the unstated portion here is that I'm not going to do those things for some. That doesn't fit the feel-good model. Listen to the way Romans says it. In 9.13, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Let's sing about that. <laughs> and the very next verse says, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. In other words, may it never be implied, much less spoken. 
He, look at it. says, what shall we say? There's no injustice. God isn't unfair when he shows mercy and compassion and grace to people. He doesn't owe the rest of those anybody else the same thing. When God acts in, on, in, in our lives, it's good. But that doesn't mean that he, when he doesn't, when he chooses to not, for whatever reason, when he chooses to not act in the same way in the lives of others, that doesn't mean he's bad. And in the very next verse, he goes back and quotes the passage in Exodus that we're reading from today. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I, will, I have compassion. John Piper said it like this, God is utterly free from the constraints of his creation. The inclinations of his will move in directions that he alone determines. Whatever influences appear to change his will are influences which ultimately he has ordained. His choice to show mercy to one person and not to another is a choice that originates in the mystery of the sovereign will, not in his sovereign will, not in the will of his creature. In other words, he'll have mercy on who he'll have mercy and he'll show compassion to whom he'll show compassion. R. Kent Hughes kind of summed it up. He said, God is not answerable to man for what he does. But we want him to be. We have a feel-good model. And what we're reading right now doesn't fit that. And so we want to either ignore that or uh, we want to ignore that and take him and put him in our model. Instead of looking at who he is and all his glory and all his grandeur and all his judgments and say, what a mighty God we serve. Our God is an awesome God. God saves some, and we know that he doesn't save others. God heals some, and we know that he doesn't heal others. God gives prosperity to some, and we know that he doesn't give prosperity to others. And he doesn't owe us an explanation for any of it. He's doing something that he is not obligated to let us in on. But we know the character and the person of God enough to know that his ways are good. This is where we just simply let God be God and have him we deal with it. John MacArthur said it like this. He said, we do not reason from our own minds back to you. Oh, God, save us from creating you in our image. What he means here is we don't reason concerning the person and the actions of God from where we are to try to get him to fit it. In an attempt to understand who God is, we can't start with what we understand and then try to make him, shoehorn him into that understanding. We have to search the scriptures, take what we find, and admit that some of it is beyond our understanding and outside of who we would prefer him to be, and we just deal with it. But not only does he have an untamable grace, he has an unseeable face. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Then the Lord said, Behold, there's a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. I believe this is one of the reasons that when we leave this world, this is one of the reasons we must, God must give us now, he, he's promised it, but this is one of the reasons that he, I believe he gives us a glorified body when we leave this world. Not only will we be freed from sin because Jesus paid the price for it and so that we will be made fit for heaven in a sinless state, but also so that we can withstand the very presence and the person of God in all his entirety. 
he himself said, you can't see me for all of who I am and survive the experience. Tony Evans said this, he says, that this means that while God let Moses see a portion of his glory, he would not show him his face, not the essence of his being. To be exposed to the unfilt, unfiltered glory of God on this side of eternity would be like entering a nuclear reactor or traveling to the sun. The divine holiness would consume us. And thirdly, God answered by showing us that he has an undeniable love. Here's something... There's something we like. But in all honesty, this undeniable love kind of shows us who and what we are. And that we may not like. In verse 5, he said, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And the focus, as you can see me, I have the word descended underlined, is his condescension is his stooping down to where we were and while we're glad for that it reminds us of where we are and where we're not in the big scheme of things I don't understand and I don't have words to explain how much God has to lower himself to get to our level and yet we sit back and judge him by what we think he should and should not do. Philip Ryken said, He is a great God, and no matter how high we reach, he still has to stoop. For us to have an encounter with God at all requires his infinite condescension. He is the creator. We are only creatures. He is enthroned in heaven. We dwell on earth below. He's God. We're not. So if he relates to us at all, he must come down. And we make that mistake of evaluating God, giving him a thumbs up or a thumbs down based on what we think he should or shouldn't do. How did we ever let ourselves get fooled into being like that? Well, it was a long process, but it, it happens when we take our eyes off of God and we start setting our eyes on ourselves. And we think that God exists for us and not the other way around. we think God should do something for us or give something to us and he does well then he's a good guy because he's met my need but if he doesn't or we think God should be like this God should always heal God should always give God should always do and he doesn't have the audacity to evaluate God using ourselves as the standard of measure I don't know about you but I'm glad God's nothing like us when in fact it is God who measures us using himself as the standard of measure oh no now suddenly God is elevated to his rightful place and we are put in ours and we find ourselves left wanting falling short that's why the Bible says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and as it is written there is none righteous not even one among humankind wages of sin is death but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord John 1 aptly describes Jesus' approach of his people when he says he came to his own the Jewish people, his own creation and those who were, who were his own did not receive him 
but as many as received him, to them, to them as many as received. You know, there's this false notion out there that we are all children of God and that God is going to interact with us based on that relationship with everybody. That's not true. It says, Jesus came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe on his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God did something special in their life. God gave them the faith to believe that what they were hearing about Jesus being the Messiah was true. And when God steps onto the scene and we recognize and elevate him to his rightful place and we recognize where we are, we need this God. He does not need us. He loves us, but he doesn't need us. Again, no matter how high a level we, we achieve, he still has to stoop. you have any doubt whatsoever about being a child of God based on the biblical definition of being a child of God, biblical explanation of being a child of God, not on what we think, not on what we think God, how God ought to think, how he ought to interact with others, but based on the truth, if you have any doubt whatsoever, because I can tell you, you know, we, we, ref, we mentioned Billy Graham early in the message and Billy Graham said a couple decades ago that he was convinced that 80% 80 of the people sitting in churches on any given Sunday morning are not truly children of God. Now, I, I, don't, I, I don't think Billy Graham had any percentile insight into the actual numbers, but, but the Bible tells us that there are, there are things that we can use to judge that to, to, of ourselves. We look at the, the small epistles, the smaller letters like 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Jude and we get to the end of the New Testament and we start reading those things and it tells us some things that if, that if they aren't currently and actively present in our lives that we don't know God. We want to base our salvation and the salvation of others on those words of a testimony or profession of faith. But just like we know that judging a, watching a person's actions will give us a better picture of who they are than listening to their words, the Bible, the, the Bible tells us that we can determine for ourselves and even in the lives of others if their words and their reality are one and the same. So if you don't have a if you don't have total confidence that you are a child of God based on the biblical measure and description of being a child of God, let me invite you to pray something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that your word tells me that my sin separates me from you. And there is only one thing that is a re remedy for that. And that is that the holy, righteous, righteous Son of God, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, died for my sin, taking upon himself the punishment, which is the penalty of sin, which is death, both physical and spiritual. There is one and only one path out of this dilemma of mine, and it is through Jesus. Because no man comes to the Father but through Him. I admit my sin, 
and I fall on my knees knowing that I need you. Jesus, I submit myself to your rightful authority over me as the Lord of my life. And as Lord of my life, you dictate how I conduct my life from this point forward. I will not get it perfect, but I will always be striving and be turned back to getting it right. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Help me to know my heart. Submitting myself to you as my Lord, I thank you for also becoming my Savior. And I thank you for saving me. If you're here today and you just prayed that prayer and you really meant it for the first time, I am now going to leave it in your hands that you would come to me. If, it's that, if this is at an importance level of your eternal salvation, I can't imagine anything stopping you from wanting to move forward. And your first act of obedience in the scriptures is to be baptized. If you have just surrendered the authority of your life into the hands of Jesus, let me encourage you to find me when we dismiss and tell me I need to be baptized. Or if you have committed your life to Jesus and you have not been baptized since, I would encourage you to do the same. Find me and tell me, Jesus is my Lord and I need to be baptized in an act of obedience. And if you're here today with full knowledge that you are indeed a child of God, Let me encourage you to open your eyes, open your ears, and open your heart to a biblical view of God so that we might have an accurate view of self. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, just a couple of things, uh, offering and announcements. As you may know, we don't pass around a, a basket anymore. A few different ways you can give if that's what you would like to do. First of all, we have the two the white receptacles, one on this back wall, one at the doors as you leave the building. Secondly, at the on the website, there is a place up in the top right uh, tab that says give. You can click there and you'll follow the bouncing ball and you'll you'll have to make sure that it says Tithes Boulder City. If it does not say Boulder City in it, it goes to the main campus. And if that's what you want to do, that is your call. But if you want it to go here, it needs to say Boulder City. Same with the app. That's how you get it. And that's what it will look like. It will need to necessarily say Boulder City if you want the giving to go here. Or last but certainly not least, you can mail your giving to the address there on the screen. We have a few things coming up. Uh, I, I mentioned them in the video that we made earlier in the week. But first of all, on Friday, this coming Friday, October 29th at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a pumpkin carving. Uh, you'll need to bring your own pumpkin. We'll provide some tools. We're, we've got some, some pumpkin carving tools. We've got some stencils on the way, and we've got some other, some other stuff to, to help you do that. But we will also, I've totally failed to put it on there, but it, we will also be having a chili potluck. If you, we're going to be providing some chili, but we would, uh, if you make a chili that you're proud of, as I've said in the video, you need to bake a big pot of it and let the rest of us try it. Or you could bring some other things that just go with chili. If you've got the video, you, you, you heard me say all those things. But uh, also, men's group meets every other Saturday. Meets right back here in the dining area. Uh, it will be meeting this Saturday, and as I said, every other Saturday after that. 
they'll meet at 11 o'clock. Let me encourage you to, to do that because, um, folks, I'm, I'm just going to have to say it. Men are under a lot of spiritual attack. Not just in the context that we normally think of the, 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 the spiritual, satanic, demonic attacks on the, the, on the things that, that drive us, but also in our culture. And our, cult, our culture would minimize the role and the effect that men have in families and in churches and in society where God does no such thing. So in order to counter that, let me encourage you to attend there. Also, we have a ladies' Bible study. They meet every other Thursday. They just met this past Thursday. So their next meeting will be two weeks from this past Thursday, not this coming Thursday, the one after that. that can, any, anybody think of any way I can confuse that more? <laughs> there's the date. There's the time. And there we also we have some uh, the, the T-shirts in the back that... Uh, have, have the logo on the front, but also have kind of our motto, and that is uh, small church, big family, a statement that came out of an advisory team meeting that just seems to fit us so well. Well, God bless you folks. Love you. I'm glad to be home. Let me encourage you to go out there this week and serve your king.